Welcome back. I hope that you were able to figure out your chord progression in the new keys, learn the new black key major finger patterns, and work through the repertoire and sight reading. Did you manage to try the new accompaniment patterns with several of your chord progressions? We'll be applying some of these techniques in new music today. I'd like to begin our lesson by diving into the Czerny Waltz that I introduced last time. Since we haven't warmed up, I'd like to ease into playing this. First, let's play the right-hand melody. Even though there are no dynamic markings indicated on the score, remember to play it at a mezzo forte or forte dynamic level, since this is the melody and it will need to project above the left hand. I'd also recommend playing it as legato or smoothly as possible. So here's the right hand of the Czerny Waltz. One, two, three. Next, I'd like to add the left hand, but rather than playing the broken chord accompaniment as written, I'd like to use the practice technique called blocking that we discussed during our last lesson. So you'll be playing the right hand as written and playing blocked chords on beat one of each measure in the left hand. Try to keep the left hand softer than the right hand. One, two, play. Since many of my students run into trouble in the second half of this piece, where the chords change more rapidly and the right hand rhythm changes, I'd like to play measures 9 to the end one more time to ensure that you are really confident with the ending. We will still block the left hand chords. Starting at measure 9, 1, 2, play. Now, let's play the entire piece as written with broken chords in the left hand. I know that there is a lot to think about as you play this, but try to listen for the balance between the melody and the accompaniment. One, two, three. So how did you do? If it went really well, I'm pleased. However, it would not be unusual to have made mistakes. If you had a stumble or two, can you identify specifically where each mistake happened? Then, do you know which hand caused the problem? Remember that your ability to listen to and evaluate your playing and to correctly identify problem spots is a critical part of improving your playing during practice. Once you know where the problem is, you can slow it down, isolate the passage, and work out the details. For now, let's move on and review one of the primary chord progressions that you practiced. I'd like to play D major with the left hand since we didn't do this together last time. And let's repeat the progression when we play it. One, two, and play. Repeat. I'd like to have you memorize the key signature for D major. 
It has two sharps, F sharp and C sharp. The key signature looks like this on the staff. Now, some of you may be thinking that this doesn't quite make sense. When we played the D major five finger pattern, we only played one sharp, F sharp. So why would there be two sharps in the key signature? Well, remember, the five finger pattern is only the first five notes of the scale. There are two more scale degrees that we haven't learned yet. The entire D major scale is spelled D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, D. So a composer could write melodies that contain Bs and C sharps, even though we haven't played them in this key yet. We'll get to that in a couple of lessons. But I'm pointing this out because you do need the C sharp for the dominant seventh chord in this key. Remember, when going from the tonic to the 5-7 the chord, the bottom note goes down a half step from D to C sharp. So let's try that chord progression together one last time to ensure that you're playing each of the chords correctly. No repeat this time. One, two, and play. Next, let's try this chord progression with the right hand. You probably haven't practiced it, but it will feel similar to the other chord progressions. One, two, right hand. You'll probably find that you have to bring your elbow in front of your chest slightly and rotate your wrist in toward the fallboard to reach the C-sharp for the 5-6-5 chord. Be sure that your piano bench is back far enough for you to be able to move your right hand freely in front of your body. So let's look at a right-hand melody in the key of D major. You may wish to take a moment to tap the rhythm of this melody. If you do, you'll notice that we've been playing these rhythm patterns, containing the half note and quarter note, quite a bit during the last few lessons. Hopefully, there is nothing about the rhythm that stumps you. Next, let's notice the range of pitches. We begin on the tonic note D. There is no fingering indicated, but if you scan ahead in the score, you'll see that you do not have any notes lower than D. So, you'll be able to place your thumb on D. Now, take a quick scan and locate the highest pitch in this example. Did you see the A in measures 2 and 6? If you place your right hand thumb on D, your pinky should be resting comfortably on the A. So, you won't need to expand your hand in order to play this melody. I'm making a point of noticing the lowest and highest pitches and recognizing if the hand needs to expand beyond the five-finger pattern or not, because later in the lesson, we'll be working on exercises that prepare us to expand the right hand in melodies. If you'd like to take a moment to shadow this melody, you may pause the video and complete that practice step. I'm going to play the melody out loud next. So please get your right hand in place over the D major five finger pattern. One, two, play. Eventually, I'll have you figure out which left hand chords work with melodies. For now, you'll see that I've provided you with the Roman numerals of the chords that work best to harmonize this melody. We just played the D major chord progression in the left hand, so let's play the block chords that are indicated below this melody along with the right hand. If you get lost as we play, drop the right hand and focus on playing the left hand chords. Both hands block the left. One, two, play. I expect 
expect that you'll need to rehearse this step several times on your own. Once you've done that, notice that the instructions ask you to harmonize this melody with a waltz-style accompaniment pattern. So let's do the left hand alone with the waltz bass. Remember to play two measures of the tonic chord, then just one measure of the 464 before moving back to the tonic. Then you keep playing the tonic chord until another Roman numeral indicates a chord change. Waltz bass in the left hand. One, two, play. Okay, once you've practiced on your own and feel ready to put the hands together in the waltz style accompaniment, it will sound like this. You may simply want to listen and observe my performance this time. One, two, three. you work on the D major harmonization example on your own over the next several days. In the meantime, let's take a look at one additional example. You'll notice that harmonization 2 is in the key of F major, so you'll need to remember to play all Bs as B flats. A quick scan of the rhythm reveals mostly half and whole notes, with a couple of quarter notes in measure 3. Did you notice the tie from the F in measure 8 to the F in measure 9? We haven't seen tied notes in several lessons, but you'll recall that you simply play the F on beat 1 of measure 8, then you hold it through measure 9. You keep the key depressed without replaying it. If you take a quick scan of the pitches, you'll notice that the lowest note in the melody is F, and the highest note is C. So once again, you can maintain the F major five finger position throughout. Let's play this melody together. One, two, three, four. You may need to play this melody several more times on your own before you feel confident with it. Next, let's try the left hand, but we'll play blocked chords first. Hold each chord for a full measure before moving on. Left hand only with the chords. One, two, three, four. When you practice, I would recommend playing the left hand with blocked chords and the right hand melody as written several times before adding the Alberti bass accompaniment. Because each individual requires a different amount of time to practice and prepare to play this harmonization, I'll let you practice on your own. But I'll remind you that the Alberti bass is played in quarter notes for now. You'll play the bottom note of the chord, then the top note, then the middle note on beat 3, and the top note on beat 4. I'll demonstrate how this example will sound once you've practiced it. Please just watch and listen right now. One, two, three, four. Notice that I played a single tonic note in the left hand on the downbeat of measure 9. This helps us to end the piece a little more softly. You may need to take a moment to shake out your hands or even to stand up and move off the bench for a few minutes. While you relax, I'd like to introduce the damper pedal. 
Some pianos have two pedals, but many have three. Regardless, the damper pedal is the pedal on the far right of your piano, and you will use your right foot to depress it. When we depress this pedal, it lifts the dampers, which contain the felt that dampens or stops the strings from vibrating. So when the damper pedal is depressed, all of the strings will ring until we release the pedal. If you are lucky enough to have a grand piano, you can easily see the dampers lift up off of the strings when you press the pedal. On an upright piano, the strings are strung vertically, so the dampers move off of the strings in a vertical motion, forward where you are sitting, until you release the pedal, and then the dampers move back to rest on the strings. If you are using a digital piano, the pedal replicates the sound of the dampers releasing from the strings. If you own a keyboard that doesn't have a pedal, check the back of the instrument, since most have a quarter-inch jack or port for plugging in a foot pedal. If possible, I'd recommend purchasing a universal sustain pedal so you can experience the effect of using the pedal when you play. Again, you will use your right foot to depress the damper pedal, and please keep your heel on the floor as you depress and lift your foot on the pedal. Keeping the heel on the floor serves two purposes. First, it allows you to have much more control over the pedal. Sometimes we will only depress the pedal part of the way, or we may need to make quick changes that require more control. Second, your quadricep muscles will become very tired if you are constantly lifting your entire foot when you pedal. I'd recommend going to the gym if you want to work on your quads. We won't try to squeeze in a leg workout while we practice piano. For now, when we're first beginning to use the damper pedal, we will link it to chord changes. So, in the beginning, it is a good idea to practice the left hand alone with the pedal. Now, this is one extra layer of coordination that we are adding, so please be patient with yourself at first. I have an exercise that I'd like you to practice this week. You're going to practice playing two-note harmonic intervals with the left hand while depressing and lifting the pedal with the right foot. This exercise will help you to get your left hand and right foot working together. But one of the first things you'll notice is that even though we are changing the pedal when we change the left hand harmony, if you are pedaling correctly, your foot will be a little behind your hands. This allows the pedal to hold the chord as you prepare your hand for the new chord. So, if you are pedaling correctly, we won't hear a rest or silence between your left hand chord changes now. I'd like to count out loud. I'd like you to count out loud as you practice the pedal exercise. Counting aloud will help you to keep track of what your right foot and your left hand are doing. So, you can see here the two note harmonic intervals in the left hand for this exercise. You will play each left hand interval on beat one. Then you will lift your hand on beat three or four and get it in place, ready to play the next interval. Meanwhile, your right foot keeps the pedal depressed, so the sound continues even as your left hand moves. Then, as you play the new notes on beat one, you lift the pedal. Then on beat two, you depress the pedal again. So, as you play the new notes, your foot lifts. Your foot will feel it's as though it's behind the left hand, because it is. I'll demonstrate this for you. Please watch and listen this time. So why don't you try it with me this time? Remember that your left hand will begin over the C and G one octave below middle C. 
And notice that your left hand will play a slightly larger interval in each measure. You'll have to expand your hand to play the sixth, seventh, and octave in the middle of the line. I'll talk you through it as we count and play. One, two, three, four. Play, pedal, three, four. Up, down, three, four. Up, down, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Up, down, three, four. Lift. I know that this likely feels awkward right now, so be sure to practice it before our next lesson. We'll make a slight modification to the exercise at the next lesson, so the more comfortable this version is before we meet again, the better off you'll be. Since we've just been playing in the key of C, let's review our sight reading example that you practiced. It's also in the key of C. Hopefully, you found the sight reading practice steps to be helpful. We won't do those now, as I assume you've already worked on this example. Let's just play it together so you can evaluate how well you learned it. One, two, three. We'll do another sight reading example at our next lesson. Up to this point, most of our melodies have been, been contained within the five-finger pattern. However, melodies can be much more interesting when the composer makes use of all of the notes in a scale. Next time, we'll encounter some melodies that expand just a little above or a little below the notes contained in the five-finger pattern. When we encounter these types of melodies, we don't necessarily need to make a big change in hand position. However, it will require slight shifts of our hand. Such hand shifts are very common in piano music. In order to make these a little easier when you encounter them, we'll learn a couple of technical exercises that will allow you to practice these shifts before you experience them in your pieces. Sometimes, we will have to cross the second finger over the thumb in the right hand to reach a note that is a step below the tonic note. When we do this type of crossover, we do this type of crossover when we only need to play one note below the tonic, so there is no need to move into a completely different hand position. So in this example, we will play the G with the thumb, then cross finger number two over to the F sharp while leaving the thumb tucked under. And then we immediately play the thumb again, bringing our hand back into our G position so the fifth finger is available to play the D, a fifth above the tonic note. I'll show you how it looks first. We play the G, we'll cross the two over to F sharp, keep your thumb tucked, then play the G again with your thumb, bring your hand back to its original position, and play the D. It sounds like this. One, two, three, four. Now, why don't you try it with me? Remember to keep your right hand relaxed, even as the second cross is over and the thumb remains gently tucked under. Remember to do the repeat. One, two, and play. G, up to D, cross over, G, up to D. Next, let's move the right hand thumb up to treble D. If we are thinking in the key of D major, when we cross finger two over, it will play C sharp. Let's try this exercise in D with the repeat. One, two, and play. Finally, let's move the right hand down a step so that the thumb is on C. In C major, 
When we cross finger two over, it will play B natural. This is a white key, so this may feel a little different to you. Just remember to keep your right hand relaxed. Let's try it with a repeat. One, two, three, four. When you're practicing these, please practice with the repeat. Also, when you refer to the notation for this exercise this week, you may notice a couple of things on the staff that look new or different. You are familiar with the repeat sign, but at the beginning of measures three and five, you will see what looks like a backward repeat sign. You'll see two lines followed by two dots. When you encounter this kind of sign on a score, it means that at some point subsequently, you'll see a repeat sign. Instead of going all the way back to the beginning, you'll repeat that segment of the music from this sign. So, in this case, when you get to measure four, you'll go back to measure three and repeat measures three and four. At the end of measure two and four, you'll see that the key signature changes. Hopefully, you'll recognize that in measures three and four, you'll be playing in the key of D major. So you'll need to remember that both Fs and Cs are sharp. The natural signs on the F and C line space at the end of measure four may look unusual. This is simply a way of indicating that now our key signature will switch from D major to C major so you won't have to worry about playing any Fs or C sharps in the following measures. The other right-hand shift that I'd like to introduce today involves gently lifting the entire hand up and down by step. If you lift off of finger three, you'll land a step higher or lower with that same finger in this exercise. I'd encourage you to lift your right hand gently and move in an arc up or down to the next note. This exercise will look like this on the piano. One, two, three, four. Lift. 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 When you look at the notated score, the fingering above the right hand will be your indication that you should gently lift and shift the right hand. Before we end today, let's review your new black key five finger major patterns that we learned last time. Let's do the D flat, then A flat, then E flat five finger scales, followed by their broken and blocked chords. We'll play one after the other without stopping for too long, and let's try them hands together. We'll begin with D flat. One, two, three, four. Now we'll move to A flat, red, D, and play. E flat, one and two and ready, play. I'd like to return to a concept from a previous lesson before we learn our last finger pattern today. The term is enharmonic. It turns out that each key on the piano can have two names. For example, this note can be called D-flat, but it can also be called C-sharp. So, when we have two notes that sound like the same pitch and look like the same key on the piano, but are spelled differently on the staff, such as C-sharp and D-flat, these are enharmonic pitches. There's one more thing. Up till now, the sharps or flats that we've played have always been on black keys but this does not need to be the case. For example, this note can be called C, but it may also be a B sharp, and this note can be a B natural or a C flat. 
There's only one more major five-finger pattern that we have yet to learn. It's G-flat. The pitches that you'll play are G-flat, A-flat, B-flat, C-flat, and D-flat. Even though the fourth note looks like a B on the keyboard, because we've already used a B-flat, we have to call this pitch by the name of C. So it's C-flat. Let's try it together. I'll play both hands, but you can choose either hand for now. One and two and ready, play. We learned a new key signature today, and we harmonized some melodies with our accompaniment patterns, and began some new technique that we will need at our next lesson. For next time, please practice the following. The major five-finger patterns and chords review all 12 of these, including G-flat major. The primary chord progressions in C, G, D, and F major two harmonization examples, pedal exercise number one, and your two technique examples. Review your Czerny Waltz and try to polish it as well. Review the chord Etude one since we'll play it at the next lesson. You may also review anything from our previous lessons that you'd like to improve or just have fun playing. Until we meet for our next lesson, I wish you happy practicing.